Good afternoon and welcome to Book Passage. Uh, it's one o'clock here on the West Coast. Some of you may be watching on the East Coast at 4 p.m. Uh, we are so excited today to have, uh, well, a, a great book and a great discussion. I've been in, talking to the author and the, uh, the other author who's interviewing him uh, prior to this, prior to going live and the, the discussion's already started lively. Um, David Gellis is uh, the author of the Man Who Broke Capitalism, a biography of, of uh, Jack Welch. He's a New York, David is a New York Times reporter and writes the popular corner office column for uh, the New York Times. And he's now covering uh, uh, all kinds of business issues, particularly as it relates to the environment. This book, The Man Who Broke Capitalism, is a fascinating and highly readable biography of a unique American character. Jack Welch made his mark as a CEO of General Electric which at the time he took over was the major manufacturing company in the United States. Um, and for dec he held that role for more than two decades. And during that time, he made some drastic, controversial, and ultimately destructive decisions. But he was persuasive enough that many other businesses followed his lead. For me, this book has also been a revelation. Uh, as a co-owner of a small bookstore during most of the period covered by the book, uh, I knew that we were frequently harmed by some of the stuff that big business was doing. What I didn't know was the extent to which other groups in society were being harmed by those same tactics as well. As David explains it, Jack Welch, uh, when he was CEO of, of GE, was a leader in a major shift in American business that began in the 1980s. This changeover included a drastic reduction in the number of employees uh, at most major businesses, a shift from manufacturing and most uh, for to financial market gimmickry, a relentless search for offshore tax shelters, and the outsourcing of works to low wage foreign countries. All in all, it was a maddening combination of things, which is still affecting American business and we're still trying to get out from under. Um, he'll be in conversation today with Jennifer Todd, who is the author of Dirty Money, Making White Collar Cotton. Uh, criminals pay. This is, she is, Jennifer is a law professor and an expert on banking law and white collar crime. The White Washington Post calls her book uh, a crisp and engaging account of the many ways that corruption is thriving in the private sector and governments at every level. You know, there's an almost perfect segue here. After reading the Gellis book, you'll probably be anxious to pick up Jennifer Tobb's book, to find mm -hmm. out how some of these well heeled folks who use white collar crime to gain and sustain wealth and so social status and political influence can be brought to justice. So without it for further uh, interrupting with the conversation, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer and to David, and I'll be talking to you at the end. Jennifer, can you take it from here? I absolutely can. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, Bill. Um, so hi, everybody, and hello to David. We're kind of meeting um, you know, in real life on Zoom for the first time right now. And it's, um, you know, if you haven't done so already, I cannot recommend enough uh, getting a copy of this book. Um, Jack Welch is a fascinating figure, um, not just for people interested in American business history or, you know, biography of, you know, famous people, but it it's also um, it, his life, you know, the sort of before during and after Jack story that we get from this book um, really reminds me of what life was um, in America before Trump, you know, before Donald Trump kind of took over and eclipsed all of our mental space and all took over all the news space. You know, we did spend a lot of time um, thinking about business and thinking about markets and um, it really, uh, even though we're seeing how much uh, the political side of our life can affect affect us, especially today, and I can't uh, I can't miss saying with you know for example the U.S. Supreme Court just um, just reversing Roe v. Wade, where you know there's so much disrupting our lives coming from government, but there was a time when in the forefront was business, and so I um, want to begin by asking David. Um, two open questions that you can just kind of keep talking about. Um, and then if you run out of things to say, I'll jump in again. But I want to know uh, why you chose this subject matter. Yeah. 
why you're qualified to write this book. I'm pretending I'm your editor. You know, when you pitched this book, why did you say you were qualified to write it? Why did you write it? And as you talk about this and the, the before, the during and after Jack Welch, mm -hmm. um, can you can you tell um, tell the, the audience a little bit about the ideas behind him, the Jensen and Meckling, the Bork and the Reagan? In other words, we're, we're, this is a book that's about the, the man who broke capitalism, but he comes forward um, from theories, not just sort of sprung full form from Zeus's head. So take Absolutely. it from there. Okay. Bill uh, and Book Passage, thanks for having us. Jen, a total delight. Uh, I said this before we went out live, but Big Dirty Money was literally one of the books that inspired me and sort of gave me the conviction and the belief that I could write this book. So thank you in all sincerity uh, for your example and for your support. It really has been transformative. And so it's a delight to have this conversation with you. Um, I'm going to, I feel like you just set the agenda for the next, uh, you know, 40 minutes or so. So I don't know if I'm going to get all of it in my first question. We may have to come back to some of it, but first I'll answer that, that fundamental question, which I think animates, you know, every author. Why did the, I write this book? Why this book? Why now? And there were two things that actually got me going on this specific project. The first is that as a New York Times business reporter, as Bill mentioned, I wrote this corner office column, which is to say I interviewed CEOs and I talked to them about their inspiration, their motivation, their leadership styles, who their mentors were, what kind of example they wanted to set, what kind of role they thought their companies played in the world. And I, I interviewed hundreds, literally hundreds of CEOs over the last five, six years here at the Times. And during the course of all those conversations, one name kept coming up. And it was Jack Welch. And it bugged me. I was like, why is this CEO who retired 20 years ago, still living rent free in the minds of today's business leaders? That was just like a puzzle for me, right? And as an author, as a curious person, you get these little questions, and you're like, there's something to that. And then in 2019, I became one of the reporters covering Boeing after the two crashes of the 737 MAX. And all of a sudden, I was on a story that for reasons I'll explain in just a sec, crystallized the degree to which this was not just a matter of history, that we were still living in Jack Welch's world. And what made me realize that is that as we started digging into what had happened at Boeing to cause these two planes to crash so tragically, killing 346 people, it was very evident from the outset that there had been an engineering failure, that they designed a flawed system that had some flawed hardware, and twice in five months, these planes were wrested out of the control of the pilots in the most terrifying way and crashed. But as we went deeper into our reporting, we realized that there was actually a cultural story that explained how those engineering decisions had been made. And that cultural story was the story of the influence of Jack Welch. Over 25 years, starting in 1997 with the merger between Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and the arrival of Harry Stonecipher, a man who had studied with Jack Welch at GE, thus begins the absolute takeover of GE on Boeing. Harry Stonecipher was the first. He was replaced by another Jack Welch protege, a man named Jim McNerney, who then was replaced, not immediately by yet another Welch successor, but today, even now, the CEO of Boeing, Dave Calhoun, was one of the men who studied under Welch and was actually considered as a potential successor to him when he retired more than 20 years ago. And so the history of Boeing over the last 25 years which is in many ways representative of the history of the American economy over this time, is actually a story that's almost entirely informed by and can't have happened without the influence of Welch. And I can go into all the reasons of the specific things that these three men did, but I would just say in the clearest terms, and they said it themselves, those three men, Harry Stonecipher, Jim McNerney, Dave Calhoun, overtly, explicitly, tried to make Boeing, a company that for hundreds of years had been focused on aeronautical engineering excellence, they turned it 
deliberately into a company that was focused on financial engineering. And in doing so, at every step of the way, they invoked Jack Welch's name and said that they were trying to make Boeing a company that he would recognize and be proud of. You know, I thank you for saying that because I feel like you're kind of peeling, you know, the curtain back and showing that the Jack Welch influence at all these places is utterly fascinating. I mean, the especially when the, the tragedy associated with Boeing, which of course I talk about that in the context of white collar crime. But I want to mention another company because you mentioned that there are all these Welch proteges. To me, one of the most fascinating pieces of this book is kind of the Sorcerer's Apprentice piece where he has this campus, which you may, maybe just can describe, where he trains not just, he trains his, his upper level managers, but when they leave, either because he pushes them out or they just want to go, they, they spread Welchism to all these other companies. And it was not until I read your book that I knew that Robert Nardelli, who ran Home Depot briefly, had been passed over for leadership at GE. He'd risen up the ranks and was one of these protégés. And I mentioned that because he is always a poster child for uh, you know, excessive executive pay. The corporate governance folks um, always talk about how he failed and was pushed out of Home Depot. And he got something like a $150 million at the number pay package, you know, uh, pay for failure. And so to know, to kind of have this cultural context. So can you tell us a little bit about how he trained people and how he spread, you know, well, actually they back up. Before we talk about how he trained people, I think people need to know what his, what is Welchism? I mean, sure. what I, I, I know it's mergers and downsizing and financialization, but it's more than that. So can you mm -hmm. tell us what it is and how he spread it? Yeah, I refer to Welchism, which is I, it's a word I made up, right? But it describes his ideology. And, and as I see it, what really animated Jack Welch, and I, this is from reading almost every word he uttered for decades and talking to more than 100 people who worked closely with him and have studied him, he was animated by a couple things. And this is what I describe as Welchism, which is the relentless desire to increase shareholder value at any cost with no regard to the consequences of his actions. And the means through which he did that were what I call downsizing, which is firing people, offsourcing, outshore, uh, offsourcing, offshoring and outsourcing, excuse me, uh, through deal making, which is mergers and acquisitions, this torrid pace at which he bought and sold other companies, and through financialization, which we can talk about in some greater detail, but which is the use of the financial operations of the company. Everything from buybacks and dividends, for example, to the actual financial businesses that GE operated in the service of this single-minded pursuit of inflating the company's stock price and returning as much cash as possible to shareholders. So it's that plus this aggressive, materialistic, bullying, alpha male style of management. All of that combined is what I refer to as Welchism. And what I just described can seem like, you know, as natural as the weather today, right? A lot of people will hear me say that. Like, yeah, that's how business works. But it's not. It wasn't always. This is the world we live in as a product of Welch and his protégés having so much influence for so long. But when you talk about, you mentioned uh, this campus, what I refer to, what was known as Crotonville, GE's sort of in-house business school. This was the place where many of them learned those techniques. But it's important to know, just briefly, that for many decades, Crotonville was teaching a whole different way of being. And that indeed, for decades before Welch came on the scene, corporate America acted and behaved very differently. And so one of the things I try to make clear in the book is that there was actually this inflection point in 19, early 1980s that things suddenly changed. And they didn't change by accident. They changed as a result of certain actions, certain decisions, and the Jack Welch was at the very center of them. And this is what's interesting to me because I'm gonna, since you talk about an inflection point, um, there's a before Jack, right? And 
So he comes in in his leadership, I guess, 1981, roughly around the same time Ronald Reagan takes office. Um, and prior to that, General Electric was known as Generous Electric. And there was more of this, and I'd never heard of that until your book, but this whole idea that if people would get a job at a factory or in middle management, you could have your job cradle to grave. It was a very, and maybe people, you know, I'm Gen X, so I've heard this talked about, but you know, my generation and beyond, people have four, five, six, seven, ten jobs, gigs, whatever it is that we do to like earn money, right? It's, it's so different from what it was then. And they had pension plans and so on. And then you say, um, you know, then then Jack comes along and shakes this up in in the in service of short term shareholder value. And why do you think he was so obsessed with shareholder primacy as opposed to prior to that, where companies like his predecessor, you you draw a, a very um, you know clean you know, clean line, or there's a nice juxtaposition between the style of the, his predecessor and his style. So what what changed in the 80s? Why was that the moment uh, for this kind of alpha male? downsizing, no loyalty type behavior. Yeah. It's important to note that things are going to change no matter what, starting in the 80s. And I don't want to pretend that everything else that was happening in the world wasn't happening, because this was a moment where after decades of rebuilding following World War II, big countries like Japan and Germany had finally rebuilt and were joining the industrialized world and were going to be major economic forces. This was a moment when the stock market had barely budged during the 1970s and people were impatient for economic growth. This is a moment of stagflation, right? Inflation was soaring right around the time Welch took over. We're all facing that right now. So there was no doubt that the world was about to change. And this was also a moment when Wall Street was in many ways, by virtue of just the evolution of technology, getting much more sophisticated, much more complex. So things were going to change no matter what. What I think Welch realized was that there was an opportunity, given all of these changes, to really focus on the maximization of short-term profits to the exclusion of everything else. And that this new landscape that he had stepped into allowed him to sort of turbocharge those efforts in a way that simply no one had ever done before. Now, the deeper question in there to me is, well, wh why him? You know, why did he do it? And people have legitimately asked me, right, if, if he hadn't done it, wouldn't someone else have? And, and maybe there's some truth to that. But before we entertain sort of that counterfactual, we got to acknowledge that GE was the most influential company in the country, that for a century, it had a precedent of setting the tone for corporate America, of essentially establishing the rules by which other companies played. And that in Jack Welch, whether it was the way he was raised by his family, whether it was what happened to him on the playground that made him so competitive, whatever it was, he came to the job with a ferocious, ruthless, relentless, aggressive, competitive streak that made him single-mindedly focused on achieving this goal of becoming the most valuable company in the world, which he ultimately did. And, and we got to give him credit for that, right? We, ha we have to acknowledge the consequences of it, but we have to acknowledge that he actually achieved some of his goals. Right. And, you know, there is something to, you know, some people say, why would managers, or sorry, why would board of directors want mm -hmm. to have someone in power who has so much ego? And it's like, well, you mm -hmm. want, the whole idea is you, you know, you're not going to get someone to run a major business, a multi-billion dollar business with hundreds of thousands or whatever it is, employees, if they don't have a big ego, right? The idea is that the board is supposed to kind of steer them in a certain way mm -hmm. and where their excesses go, you know, where the risks go, where the rewards don't follow, that's where you don't want to have them go. But in your book, you show so many signs of his um, wanting to take credit for all the upside, but if something went wrong, never being accountable. Um, yeah. And that's not, that's very familiar um, from the work that I do. And yeah. I and I, but I want to um, I, I want to make a note because as a lawyer, you know, we talk, you know, I think 
um, sometimes slightly different than an historian in that mm. I, I always think, well, what were the legal mechanisms or the regulatory mechanisms that changed, that allowed things? And you reference these. It was so great in your book, for example, when he was on his merger tear. I, the numbers were unbelievable. How many mergers a month? It was like- He did a thousand deals in 20 years. Okay. It's unbelievable. I was an in-house lawyer at a company. Before I went to Fidelity Investments, I was at a small company in Connecticut that um, was on a merger binge too. And it was growing earnings through mergers, right? Yeah. Um, and, and growing earnings, essentially, what, growing earnings and growing the balance sheet. Yeah. Essentially growing earnings, because when you talk about, and I think they were uh, um, uh, obviously enamored of wealth, and I'll tell you why in a number of reasons, but moments, but um you talk about him being obsessed with uh, short-term uh, shareholder value and we're giving that to Wall Street, but the customer starts to be um, institutional shareholders. That is it. Those are his customers instead of the regular people who buy this, the equipment. That, if that's the customer, um, he also wanted to deliver smooth earnings, mm -hmm. which is different than just, you know, he wants to make, it was every, every quarter, even earnings, earnings growth, which is actually, they were manufactured. He was yeah. manufacturing those earnings. And um, sometimes people call it earnings management, but you know, it was manipulation. And there's a question as to whether it might've actually been outright fraud. You know, we don't have evidence of that, but it doesn't smoothing earnings by booking things in a certain way or laying people off at a certain time, or, you know, there's just different ways to do this. And I, we all have questions about whether that was entirely lawful, but I raise this because when I was working for that small company in Connecticut, it ended up, um, it was growing. It's um, it was, it was using this merger strategy and you, and you reference the fact that the accounting rules change, but what, what changes you used to be able to do this thing called a, a pooling, right? Mm -hmm. A merger where you could, so you could act normally if, if you buy assets um, and then, and you overpay for them, you have to write it down on your balance sheet. It looks like then all of a sudden your balance sheet looks bad. It looks like you have these, these um, losses, or it looks like you, you've shrunk. And, but with this pooling, this kind of merger through um, merger of companies through pooling, you could pretend as if you'd always been together. There was a mm -hmm. lot of sleight of hand. So that's one thing. Can you tell us the kinds of things Instead of just guessing what Jack Welch did that was sneaky, can you tell us some of the techniques that he either invented or people emul emulated that do not seem entirely above board, but may have been lawful that you, that these tricks that you, you document? Yeah, well, there's, there's so much there. And, and one of the things uh, I want to recognize is that we can't actually know all the details at this point, precisely because, as you said, the rules just simply weren't as strict. And I hope we can come back to this because it's something you have a huge amount of familiarity with. But it was only after Jack Welch retired that Sarbanes-Oxley was passed and the accounting rules got much stiffer. And that all, of course, happened after the scandals like Enron and WorldCom and Tyco. Um, but before that- and my company, which was Sendent, but we'll get to that. Okay, I want to hear about that. But it was in the years before that, you know, some of what we even expect is sort of basic transparency by corporations today, order earnings calls, uh, opportunities from institutional investors to ask questions in public of the CFO and the CEO, and real broken out detailed granular uh, 10Ks when 10 Qs, where you understand exactly what parts of businesses uh, of a business are making what kinds of money. There just wasn't that level of transparency. Instead, Jack Welch himself called it the blob, right? GE Capital, which is where so many of these financial businesses were, was this amorphous collection of ever-changing assets that, as you said, could deliver what analysts called earnings on demand. So for example, with some specificity here, if they were looking two weeks out, and that's how quickly it would happen, two, three weeks out before the quarter. And they recognized that maybe they had told their analysts, told the street, told Wall Street, the stock market analysts, that they were expecting, I'm going to make up a number here, but they, they were expecting, you know, a certain EPS that was, was an earnings per share, and that they were going to expect a $320 million profit in the quarter. That's their guidance they give out. Right? That's the guidance. They said, we think this is exactly what we're going to make. 
And it, and a few weeks out, they're saying, oh, it looks like we might be a little soft. It might be coming in at like 270. So there's that 50 million gap. Where are you going to find $50 million in profits in a matter of weeks? Well, they had an army of financial analysts and wizards and bankers who could make that happen. And they could do it by, for example, firing people or shutting down some factories and taking a charge. Or they could do it by, in a flash, selling their stake in a commercial real estate deal. And they could do well, it. Well, you know, they might have, sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, something just- Something else last... they might have been doing, which was, because um, our company got in trouble for this. I didn't know about this. I was a marketing warrior until I got involved in this fraud or interested right. in it. Um, but there was this, this uh, cookie jar reserves. So if you're always doing mergers, yeah. you're allowed to set aside money on the balance sheet. And like, if you have right. expenses related to the merger, you draw down against it. So when you present your numbers to analysts, she was like, you're like, before the earnings, you know, before, before the um, one-time charges, this is what yeah. our EPS would have been. Well, it's yeah. bullshit. They're putting ordinary expenses up against this yeah. merger reserve. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of so many shenanigans, right? And and then they would also, and they, they it finally caught up with them, right? It, you you said it, and it's true, and I say it. Welch was never uh, charged with accounting fraud or anything like that. But GE settled massive accounting fraud charges with the SEC in 2009, and it revealed this insane pattern of things like saying that they sold you know two billion dollars in locomotives in December. But actually, they didn't. They convinced one of their financial partners to buy the locomotives. They held them. They sat at GE for another six months until the actual customer agreed to buy them. And then sort of the money went back to GE. I, these were absolute shenanigans. And they got busted for it. But it was all in the service of smoothing earnings. And when the SEC settled with, well, with GE in 2009, the period under which was under review was I think 2003 to 2005 roughly, but the SEC made it clear and beat the drum over and over in their announcement that this kind of thing had been happening for decades at GE. And the implication could not have been clearer that well, well, Imelt, Jeff Imelt was the CEO at the time of the settlement. Jack Welch was absolutely implicated in it as well. So, so here's the thing I don't get, mm. you know, I. I understand liking luxury things or wanting to have a nice lifestyle, having an expensive divorce, blah, 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 blah. But how much do you need? Is it just a competition among these guys at this echelon? Because why, I mean, is it, because I don't, you know, lack of empathy, like all the stuff they do to downsize people, you know, ordinary loyal employees when they don't need to, I just don't, it just doesn't compute why it would make you happy to be a total asshole, you know? Yeah, I mean, did you, one, know, did you one, get that from, from any from studying him? One one person I speak with in the book, um, uh, Raj Martin from uh, the University of Toronto Business School. He, he, I think said it, and it can sound flip when he says it at a certain point, but I think there's some deep truth. He said it was a game. It's a game these people play. And it's, it's actually not about just the accumulation of money for the sake of buying a bigger boat. The point that the, the actual process of just winning is addictive in its own right. And Welch figured out how to play the game arguably better than anyone else. But it, it it's what were the costs. And the last chapter in the book, I think, is called Negative Externalities, right? And that's an econo a, a, a term economists use to describe like all the stuff that happens as a result of doing business, right? There are going to be positive externalities, but there were a lot of negative externalities when it came to GE. You know, you can't understand the legacy of this company without understanding the tens of thousands of people that Jack Welch fired every year because he embraced a, a practice called stack ranking where he demanded that people get fired. You can't understand the legacy of GE without looking at cities like Schenectady, where there was once a thriving manufacturing base and a major American industrial city. But when Welch realized he could make the same things there for pennies on the dollar in Mexico, he sent all the factories there and all the jobs there. And now we have these shells of cities, not only in upstate New York, but across the Rust Belt, across the country. And you can't understand. And let me just say one thing yeah. that's most, so, that he's mostly famous for mm -hmm. this, what you call, you can 
talk about it, the stacking um, of, uh, of, of ranking employees. Why don't you talk yeah. a bit about, about that? Yeah. I mean, stack ranking is one of these sort of absolutely perverse management innovations that came about under Welch. And here's how it works. It, he says, Jennifer, you have 800 people uh, on your team. I need you to put 20% of them into the top key tier. Those are your best people. You get 20% in the top tier. The next 70%, that middle, those are the B players. We got the A players who are 20%. The B players are going to be 70%. Then you got your C players. Those are the bottom 10%. Those C players, they have to go home. Every single year, your bottom 10% get fired. And this was one of these sort of cold-hearted things. You mentioned this cradle-to-grave employment. That was existing. That was how things operated until Welch came along and started implementing practices like this. And if we think that's just ancient history, think again, because it's at companies like Uber and WeWork today still use stack ranking. This stuff is still a part of the DNA of corporate America. And it was Welch who came up with it. And they call it rank and yank is what rank and, and yank right it's terrible be, um it's also you know i heard a great talk by um bill black who mm. uh has written a lot about uh, the savings and loan debacle um and white collar crime and he talks about enron and enron had the same uh stacked uh ranking you know rank and yank policy and when you have that kind of fear that your manager could put you on that bottom list it's yeah. not only the worst performers who end up there, right. it's anyone who raises any kind of issues. And so people uh, would either be fired or they would leave when they saw fraud. So these systems aren't just about excellence. And at some point you have to ask you know, yourself, you know, if you're firing or letting all these people go, you still have to pay pensions and things like, like there's all these costs and the short term he's showing, you know, anyway, you, you know, he's showing the numbers look good in the short term, but then when he leaves the whole place, we'll talk about that. So he's got before we have the before we have the during policies, we have how his, um, you know, his little acolytes spread the poison or the success elsewhere. So and then what happened at GE? So when people try to imitate him, the moment may have passed 20 years later. Yeah. Um, and so what happened when some of these acolytes, besides Robert Nardelli, went out into the world? When did it work? When didn't it? And where are we today? Is Welchism still alive and well or something better replaced it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start answering in just a sec, but I'm going to invite um, I'm going to invite our generous viewers who are spending some time with us to, uh, I think you can ask questions in the comments or in the chat. I don't know exactly where you're supposed to enter it. Uh, and we're going to try to answer some of them live. So um, we're, we're happy to get that soon. Um, what you described with Bob Nardelli, who took over Home Depot immediately after he didn't find out, he found out he didn't get the top job at GE when Welch retired, is a process that just repeats itself ad infinitum across corporate America. And I documented the book that literally dozens and dozens of CEOs who studied under Jack Welch, studied at Crotonville at the management center, learned how to do the GE way of business, and went to a different company. And without fail, here's what happens. They get a multi-million dollar contract that ensures them of a gilded retirement, no matter what happens, no matter how they perform. The stock price of that company often goes up. It often pops just on, upon the announcement that they're taking over because investors are sort of salivating. They think, oh my God, if he was at GE, he knows how to turn a quick buck. The stock's going to go up. So that's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy right there. The stock price pops up. But then the manager, the new CEO, comes and starts implementing his own version of Welchism, starts laying off people, starts cutting costs, cuts back on research and development, takes a harder line with suppliers, and almost without fail, in time after time, this all lasts for a matter of months or maybe a couple quarters or maybe a few years before all of these bad decisions catch up with them. And what happens? Customers get unhappy. Morale at the company craters. The stock price starts to sink. And that individual, that CEO, who was much valued when he was hired away from GE, is fired but still gets his payout. And that's the kind of impunity 
Jennifer, that I, I want, I would invite you to comment on, you know, why is it, why is it in a world when it's so obvious to see abject failure, when it's so easy to document the incompetence of some of these men, and they're mostly men, let's just be honest about it. Why is it that it is so hard to hold them accountable? And why is it, I'm going to put this back to you, not only hard to hold them accountable, but it keeps getting worse. CEO compensation keeps going up every year, even as there's less and less accountability. What gives? So um, I'll start with the last question. I think it, 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 be careful of what you wish for in terms of the compensation. There has been this idea that pay transparency would be really important because the shareholders, mm -hmm. the public would see just how much these CEOs were getting paid um, compared to, you know, in their own minds, compared to what a rank and file worker is getting paid. But as soon as they start publishing in the 10K and the proxy, or maybe the proxy statement, how much everyone makes, you know, another CEO can look at that and say, fuck, why am I, sorry, I guess I'm, what, they may say that, they're like, why, you know, why is Gellis getting, you know, 20 million, I'm only getting 15 million, and I'm, you know, in the same market as him, and I, we did better, you know, so, the, the more disclosure, the more transparency, sometimes the more ratcheting up of this stuff. Um, also, um, in terms of, you know, impunity, he, you know, there's different levels of impunity, right? If the shareholders want to come after uh, a firm for mismanagement, most of these places, most of these firms are incorporated in Delaware and Delaware law has in Delaware courts mm -hmm. are, have been, things are changing a little bit recently, have been very management favorite. A management mm -hmm. uh, have a sort of bias toward management, not toward shareholders. So it's extremely difficult in Delaware yep. to even hold, um, even for a breach of fiduciary duty, like a duty of care, um, or even duty of loyalty, very hold, hard to hold uh, the uh, managers or the board accountable. Um, so there's that. In terms of getting outright into, um, let's it, 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 you know, sort of um, self governance. Why don't the auditing firms mm. hatch this stuff and um, in some cases, the audience firms don't want to, but in reality, the, the problem is it's all set up uh, for failure. You you put a, you know, someone who's just out of, you know, getting a BBA, just out of undergraduate business school, or just got a master's in accounting, and you put them in a conference room where they're going to deal with, like, the CFO of a giant corporation, and they're supposed to be asking them, oh, can you give me this? Can you give me that material? And you're getting close to your deadline, and they say, do you have this? Oh, I'll get it for you. I get it. So someone who's committing fraud, you know, some the CFO who's in on the fraud is going to deliberately withhold documents from the junior level accounting firm. And at the very last minute, what is that junior level accounting person going to tell their boss? I didn't get the information. They're just going to try to cover it up and get it done and push the audit through. I mean, right. the psychology of this, it's, you know, and you hear, and I'm not just making this up. This is part of business school case studies, what is done. So you know, the system isn't um, set up to really ferret out or discover major fraud. And no. so that's one thing. And then in terms of even criticizing people, you interviewed at the, toward the end of your book, you talked to, you know, these other uh, well-known CEOs like Jamie Dimon and others, and no one has a bad word to say about Jack, but why are they going to? I mean, they know there's a target on their back. Well, you're yeah. in a club of people and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, membership has its privileges. And one of those is you don't go, go after each other. And, you know, they're called imperial CEOs for a reason. Right. Well, let, let me just pick up on that because in an earlier question, you, you said something to the effect of, you know, we've talked a lot about the Jack Welch world, but is it changing at all? And it, I got to give credit where a little credit's due, which is to say that uh, I've been covering business for, for years now, more than a decade. And it is undeniably true that something has shifted. The ethos of business has shifted, I'll give it seven years, roughly. Um, it probably started right after the financial crisis of 2008, but it's taken a, it took a little while to sort of coalesce. And when you hear CEOs talking about stakeholder capitalism or ESG investing, environmental, social, and governance, or CSR, corporate social responsibility, all of this is in the lexicon in a way that it just wasn't during Jack Welch's time and even for most of the 2000s and into the 2010s. Now, how much of that is just lip service? How much of this is greenwashing? Probably a whole heck of a lot. 
But it's also true that I do believe that because so many CEOs look around and recognize that we're living in a, a, a rather broken world right now, a rather broken country. And I think many of them recognize that our government is not riding to the rescue with a whole lot of solutions. Yep. There is some recognition among the corporate leaders that business, lo and behold, actually plays an enormous role in shaping our society. And then unless they want things to keep getting worse at just about every level, they got to figure out how to do their own small part to make things better. And so I highlight a few examples of that in the book. Now, again, PayPal uh, paying its workers, you know, $20 an hour is great. That's not going to fix our problem. Unilever cleaning up its supply chain and like, you know, using organic palm oil. That's great. We need more companies trying to do that stuff, but that's not going to fix it the degree and the depth of the problems we have inherited from men like Welch is so enormous in the same way that it was a generational project to get us into this mess. I really believe it's going to be a generational process to help undo, to actually go through the work of trying to reverse some of these trends that we've got going on. You know, and I agree with you and I am more optimistic about this maybe than most people, even mm, though- Okay, like, tell me okay, why. So Okay, so even though, and I saw it in, in your book, you know, even though we were, you know, we can kind of roll our eyes at the business roundtable in 2019 said we're no longer going to make shareholder primacy our focus, we care about stakeholders, and then they were the first to like lay people off during COVID and all this stuff. It's, you know, it's easy to sort of mock that as greenwashing, but I've seen a real change, and I'll give you one concrete example. Um, uh, earlier um, this month, I went to a conference at the Said Business School at Oxford. Yep. And um, the last time I had been there was 15 years ago, and I had presented my first academic paper. It was on mutual fund activism, and I was really interested in CSR and ESG, blah, blah, blah. Well, in the last 15 years, and no one was talking about um, institutional shareholders in the academic mm -hmm. research, really, maybe me and a couple others. 15 years later, it's, people are focused on that. And there was someone there um, from, from um, BlackRock who's the head of um, like corporate social responsibility um, and proxy voting stuff at BlackRock, and they're really serious. They're talking to their institution. Their, mm -hmm. their institutional clients have come to them and said, we care about ESG. You know, we care about CSR. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and I know these things, they mean two different, they, there's a lot of a debate about where the term ESG came from. Have you heard this story? It came from Cooking. No, I want to hear this. Oh my gosh, there was a paper someone presented, Elizabeth Pullman, who's an expert in corporate mm. governance, says everyone says ESG, but no one really knows what it means. And it turns out it dates back to something that Kofi Annan did with, with the UN trying to bring people together. I'll send you that paper later. But um, but I yeah, but I do think that something has changed and we can't expect mountains to be moved. Um, but we need, if you don't get business focused on climate. You're not yep. going to get government because we all know right. how people get elected. And all it takes is one senator from the state of coal to stop a climate change bill. So how do we, you know, how do we get this, um, how do we get the, the, you know, people, the mindset to change? Um, and I think it's, I think it's important. And I think it is changing. Um, I see also all these labor unions. Yeah, um, that's an amazing you know, story. Organize really Amazon, good. and I think Trader Joe's near where I am, they're trying to organize a labor mm -hmm. union. And one of your suggestions is to actually have, um, you know, co-determinancy, I guess, or to have, have you know, met people from labor or from employees sit on the boards of the board they do in Germany. We need to, you know, we need to think more about really this being a team effort and, the, right. and sort of in stopping with this shareholder primacy, I think it's important. Because um, as, as, let me just add, add one other thing. The, uh, one of the interesting areas that I've often studied is this idea of the universal owner. Have you heard this concept? No, tell us about it. So universal owner. So you talk about, people talk about shareholder primacy and they say, well, I have to destroy the competition or I have to screw over my suppliers because I need to make money for my shareholders. But institutional investors and fiduciaries often own the whole market. You know, they're investing money for, sure. uh, right? And so while, you know, they're not just owning the company who's the aggressor hurting the supplier, they also own stock in the supplier, own bonds in them. So if you're a universal owner, you kind of own the whole market. So you don't actually want someone to kill another company or exploit right. them. So it's an interesting, it's not That's so, who, yeah, we don't really know who is the shareholder too. 
but but here and this makes me think of a question that you asked earlier that I didn't even come close to trying to answer, which is you said tell us about sort of the ideas that that underlie Welchism, and what we're starting to talk about here is the ideas that might provide an intellectual foundation for a reimagining of how our economy works and who it works for. But but I don't want to try to dodge the question. Well, the answer to the question you asked earlier, which is that like, what did Welsh just come out of nowhere and do this? The answer is no, right? There was a group of conservative economists that started in the 60s and really in the 70s promulgating a totally different vision of the role of business in society from the one we described earlier with, you know, cradle to grave retirement and a deep relationship between the employer and the employees. And it was men like Milton Friedman, right? And, and what Friedman said famously in the New York Times Magazine in 1970 was that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. And it was that simple. And it was that intellectual sort of crystallization and just the, the most simple idea that Welch then glommed onto and actually put into action. But here, I think it's so important. We got to recognize it. there is such a profound difference between theory and action, because Friedman said that in 1970. It wasn't for another 10 years before Welch actually started putting it into practice. And really, no one else did it in between, not with the conviction and the resources to make such an impact. And in the same way that everyone's talking about ESG right now and talking about CSR and stakeholder capitalism, it's like, show me the company, the big multinational company with billions of dollars of resources, who's going to have the conviction to actually put their full muscle behind it and start redistributing their profits in a different way and taking care well, of their employees in a different way. I have one. There's okay. this company, so there's this company, I finally saw their headquarters, not headquarters, but one of their buildings and some of their shops. In England, there's a company called John Lewis Partnerships. Have you okay, heard of them? I don't them? know them. No, what are yeah, they, they own a lot of, they own department stores and they also own a grocery chain called Waitrose. Okay, and, yeah, I know Waitrose. Uh, yeah, and uh, they're employee owned. Okay. Cooperative, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and they survive. They survive through the financial crisis. They've. Mm -hmm. They're still there. They're just like right on this. You know, you can buy. You know, go to the shop and buy. You know, biscuits and think whatever they buy. You know, foods. That That's brilliant. That's brilliant. But but th what we're talking about there is new models of ownership or yeah, old yeah. models that can be new again. And you know, things like cooperatives, right? Like, why is it that some external people get to make actually? make all the money that a company makes. Like, what about all the people that live and work there? And you want to um, pay, I mean, you know, I'm I'm not, you know, sort of a, you know, card-carrying communist here. Like, I, you know, I, I am. Do, you're, you're and also, I, I don't want a, a flipping town meeting. Like, right. I don't really want everything to be a democracy. Like, I don't want to right. vote for everything. So okay. if I were working at a business, I might want to work like, you know, I like to write, so maybe, or I'm a lawyer. Maybe I want to be a lawyer at the business, or I want to do, like, PR or whatever. I don't want to make all the hiring, firing decisions and decide like yeah. what the drinking fountain has to be and if there's asbestos in the thing. So pay those people more. Like I'm totally yeah. fine with that, you know. Yep. But it's yep. all about we have a society, one of the wealthiest places in the world where there's such a poor distribution of resources. There's plenty. Yes. So yeah. I don't this I you know somehow it, it, somehow it's not it's not all working the way uh, you know the way Adam Smith said it would. So no, indeed not. Uh, I always get a question because I wrote the book on Jack Welch, but I think you might have an answer too. Who's the Jack Welch of today? I mean, I've got my answers, but you know enough oh, about- Oh, come on. You know damn well who it is. It's yeah. Elon Musk, <laughs> there it is. right? Is that what you were going to say? I wanted to hear what, I wanted to see where you had. <laughs> it's Elon Musk. I mean, it's got to be him. Or, you know, you could say Jeff Bezos, but- you know, I feel like um, Musk is into a whole other, whole other, uh, you know, whole other space, but he's, uh, or it could have been, yeah, yeah, you know, some of the, the tech bros mostly is what I would think. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's, there are reasonable parallels there, and I, I've made them before, uh, it, and I think there's a really a direct line between Welch and Musk, especially when it comes to um, their, their their attitudes and their aggressive personalities and their willingness to sort of stir up controversy for the sake of doing so. 
the 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 difference I always point out is that for all his complications, Elon Musk actually is an entrepreneur. He has built companies, and that is something Welch never did, which makes it all the more remarkable that he became something close to a billionaire in the 1990s mm. by just running a company. He was hired help, and they may put him on the Fortune 400 list of the richest Americans in the world, you know, and the richest people in the world, just for being a people manager. And that's, you know, we met, we've referenced executive comp a few times in this conversation, and it is symptomatic to me of our society's sort of skewed priorities. And maybe as we get close to the end of this conversation, I will end, you know, somewhere close to where I begin the book, which is, yes, this is a book about a man, but to me, this is ultimately a book about a system. Uh-huh. And Beyond the system, uh, the economic system that we've talked about, there's a, there's a system of thought that sort of underlies and, and underpins the way we relate to business leaders in this country and the way and the degree to which we sort of worship our CEOs and put rich people up on pedestals just for the sake of being rich. I think speaks to some of our sort of warped priorities. But it's and, not just about, to me, it's the, you know, I, I have a lot of issues with Elon Musk and yeah. obviously Jack Welch, but I think what's what I admire about, you know, the side of me that admires them, because, mm. you know, I'm not someone who just sees people in black and white. I admire people who get shit done, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if the building got built and it still stands up, the rockets stuck their landing, you know, after whatever those things yep. were, you know, like, I like that. You know, I don't, you know, well, when the Teslas like not run people down the street, that's not so good. But I mean, there's something to be said about effectively managing people and mm-hmm. resources to get sure. something done. Sure. And shit gets messy. It's not great. The pro- Yeah. I mean, but um, so that, I mean, I think there's, th- there's that, but in terms of the system, shouldn't the ego gratification and getting paid more than others and being treated well be enough? Why would you be happy? If you think you can do anything, if you think you're a God, then, then if the whole world you live in, people are living in poverty and the roads and bridges are falling apart, then that people think that's on you. If you're so smart, fix it. Like, why can't we get some of these these egotistic people to try to fix the mess we're in? One of the most give them credit. Uh, like, yeah, I know. One of the most powerful moments of the in the reporting process for this book, and I described this moment in, in, in late in the book, in the last chapter, I think, maybe the last few pages. I interviewed Welch's successor, a guy named Jeff Immel, who ran GE for 16 years after Jack. And I asked him a version of this question. I was like, when you look out, right? Like you're worth hundreds of millions of dollars now. When you look out on the street, like, do you think everything's okay? I don't, like, why do you think it is that people un, like sort of hate business right now and are like resentful of people like you? And he took a minute and he said something to the effect of, I get it, right? When a company like GE told a factory worker who was making $30 an hour in the 1990s that his job was going to Mexico and maybe there's a job in the next town over that was now going to pay him $13 an hour, Jeff said, I get it, right? Like that, that right there represents sort of the corrosion of the American dream. The social contract, and, yeah. And, and it's been going in that one direction for decades now mm-hmm. because of Jack Welch. And to hear even his chosen successor acknowledge that was to me a recognition, you know, a, a moment where I was like, oh, you know, even, even the men who have benefited the most from this system, when they're really honest with themselves, at the end of the day, when they look back, it's gotten so bad they can't help but acknowledge the true impact of this kind of an economy. And that's why I don't know why they don't come to the table for something like Medicare for more. Because yeah. that would help small businesses, that would help people, I you know? know. I mean, there's so much, you know, they could they could do, but they, they don't, they'll just go play golf. I mean, you know, I, right? I mean, what is he doing now to, if, if, if he gets it, can he really get it? Uh, yeah, I mean, and and Welch in retirement, of course, did not devote himself to philanthropy. He, as I described in the book, you know, went on this sort of bombastic tear of uh, promoting conspiracy theories at times, starting a 
for-profit online MBA school, you know, nothing, none of the sort of the virtue signaling that we see from some of today's billionaires. Yeah, no, and he also was a, um, I guess he was a, in, into some supporting of his uh, fellow business colleague, right? Because because I, you know, we haven't mentioned, the people probably know that he once was in charge of NBC. He was indeed, and in fact, I mean, I, I'm. I'm always sort of relieved when I get through a conversation without talking about Donald Trump too much, but yes. <laughs> but you mentioned him earlier in the conversation, and Welch and Trump were pals. They were business yep. partners. They supported each other's different ventures, and in the run-up to Trump's election, Welch supported him on the campaign trail. Welch propagated conspiracy theories about the Obama administration, and when Trump took the office, Welch showed up in the White House as an economic advisor to President Trump. And, you know, if that doesn't demonstrate the degree to which he was still a part of sort of the zeitgeist, he was still having this sort of astonishing relevance decades after he's retired, I don't know what can. Right. No, yeah. you, picked a, you picked a good subject matter. I'm curious whether um, any of his family members or any of his, his fans have sent you hate mail or anything like that? I haven't received, uh, listen, a lot of people uh, still admire Jack Welch. And we just, as we discussed, it, depending on sort of how you hold the diamond up and look through the light, there's, there are things you could admire. Um, I reached out to many of his supporters and partners over the years, very few of the ones who you would expect to uh, be supportive of his legacy to this day, decided to talk to me. I fully respect that. Um, I've gotten some, you know, some nasty comments, but no, no physical hate mail yet, which is, which oh. I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for, uh, yeah. That's yeah. great. But listen, this is, what I wanted to do with this book is start a conversation and it's conversations like this, conversations like the one I've been having uh, over the past few weeks about not only, you know, it's not just about the man. I say this again, not just about the man, but about the system, what's wrong with our economy and how we can fix it. That's the conversation I think we need to be having right now. Can I interject here and say this has been a great conversation? Uh, I want to thank both of you. This is, you know, sometimes you, you don't exactly know exactly how to finish up one of these things, but I would say this is one of the most interesting and informative hours I've ever spent. Uh, I would tell, you know, I would suggest to viewers if they have friends that haven't seen this, this will be shown again on our, you can find it on our website and on, on YouTube. Um, there's you, well, what can I say? I'm talking from the perspective of a, of a bookstore. We have no excessive executive compensation here, no offshoring of profits. We have lots of stakeholders and I'm, I'm listening to a description of a world that seems completely foreign, even though we're both supposedly part of the economy. Uh, it's been really informative and I can't thank you enough. So again, for anyone who just tuned in, it's Big Dirty Money from by Jennifer Taub and the man, the man who broke capitalism by David Gellis. And it's been a great conversation. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Support your local